today we kind of wrap up everything about our Christmas series and we finish it up with Matthew chapter 2 verses 1 through 12. Matthew chapter 2 verses 1 through 12 as we wrap up knowing scripture to change our future with a journey to find the king, the journey to find the king. So let's go ahead and go before God in prayer and we'll get started. Father God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to always look at your word and to see exactly what is taking place by firsthand witness accounts. And we thank you for the opportunity to also see these people that we call Magi that traveled so far to find this king that they knew would be a king that was different than all other, to find this king that they knew would be a king that was different than all other kings. So just bless us and be with us, Father, as we move through this passage and as we go through the sermon. And thank you so much for the fact, Father, that we know that we can find this king as well. I pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we continue in our series this morning and we are looking at said, I want us to look at them and listen to them with new and attentive ears. And here's the reason why, because the Lord has a way of using his word to speak directly into our lives at just the right time in a way that you have never heard it before. If you are willing to just listen to him. Now, Jesus said in John 14, verse six, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the father. Jesus is saying that he is the truth and the truth is what you and I need in our life in order that one day we can be in heaven with the father. Then we must seek the truth of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus also said in John chapter eight, verse 32, that if you hold to my teachings, you're really my disciples. And then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So now I pray we and the truth will set you free. So now I pray we all want our future to be better. I pray that we all want our future to be more rooted in Christ and in his word. However, in order to change our future, we have to know scriptures and the lessons in which it teaches because they are timeless and they apply to us no matter where we are in our life. So true freedom, of course, says, but what are we free from? Well, as we say each and every single week, we can be free from, obviously, the chains and the shackles that come with sin at large, but we can break that down into groups and sizes that we know much better, things like fear and shame and guilt and the culture, people's opinions, self-centeredness, self-pity, anger and arrogance, self-centeredness, self-pity, anger and arrogance, and I could go on and on literally with hundreds of other things. Remember, we are reminded each week as well, there's only two ways to change our future. One is to the better. In other words, we should study the scripture and allow the words of God to not only change, but to transform our life and our thinking. And the second way is simply just keep doing a compromise to compromise and so on and so forth. And you will one day wind up asking yourself, how in the world did I ever get here? You see, it's your choice as to which you will do. But the question that you have to wrestle with is what are you going to do with your opportunity to change? Will you squander it? Or will you use it to change to become the person that God created you to be? Looking at another familiar account, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And this is what it reads. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during a time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is this one who is born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. His star in the east, and we have come to worship him. And when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law and asked them, where's the Christ to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, and by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. And then Herod called the Magi secretly to find out the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and he said, go and make careful search for this child. And as soon as you find him, go and make careful search for this child. And as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. And after they heard the king, they went on their way. And the star that they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, overjoyed. And on coming to the house, they saw the child and his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and they worshiped him. They opened their treasures and they presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. <clears throat> and having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Now, now we have a ten or the wise men arriving on the scene of the birth of Jesus. Of course, that's what we always picture. And we get this idea from movies, from plays, whenever we talk about the Christmas account. But that's not really how it happened at all. See, the Magi didn't make it to see Jesus until he was probably about 18 months old. Now, we don't know the exact age, 
but it was well after his birth and before he was the year he was two years old. Now, the Greek word megos actually is the English word magi, which means wise men, magician, astrologer, combining both secular and religious aspects of knowledge and understanding, a priest. Now, these men were probably Zoroastrian in thought. It's one of the oldest one of one of the oldest one of the oldest religions in the world. Now, they as well believed in one universal, transcendent, all good, and uncreated supreme creator deity. They call him, called him the Aurora Mazda, or the wise Lord. But other than that, their theology begins to move a bit out there. Century. So even if the wise men were Zoroastrian, their thinking would not match what the Zoroastrian theology is today. Now the question that is often asked is, why did the Magi follow the star? The Magi would have, would have been a combination of philosophers, astrologers, and priests. And they would have studied the philosophies of all the peoples around them. Around them. The Jewish people, by the way, would have been one of them. However, we have to also remember that the God of Israel and the people of Israel would have been well known. You see, we cannot downplay the impact of how God led the Israelites out of Egypt. The conquest of Canaan, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. And Daniel. The, we cannot downplay the impact all of them would have left, let alone, by the way, King David and King Solomon, as well as many other things. So by studying the Jewish thinking, what would, or what would, you, you know, what you and I call the Old Testament today, by the way, they would have looked for the signs that would have indicated this great king who was to sit on the throne of David and rule forever. And this would have caught their attention. Now, at any time in history, it's always good to know the kings that are around you. See, this allows you to know what to expect. For example, are they a lover of war? Are they strong enough to defend their kingdom? Or are they swayed by money and power? Can they be bribed, if you will? You see, it's always good to know the leaders around you. But these men knew the ancient literature of Israel. And they knew that this king to come was not like any king before him or after. And so they saw the unusual star in the sky. And of course, this would have, would have been the time that they was going to pick up, pack up, and begin to head out to see this new king. With all this in mind now, let's go ahead and look at our first point today. First point I want to talk about is the Magi. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is this one to be born the king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. Again now, the first thoughts of the Magi is that since this one is born king of the Jews, inheriting David's throne, if you will, he must be in Jerusalem. After all, that's the capital of Israel. And of course, that's where the king and his court was. That's where you're going to find the Jewish ruling council. And that's even where you'll find the Roman governor. So why would this not be the home of the new king? Why would he not be there? And as they approached King Herod, it would have been obvious to him that these men, at this time in history, people carried with them letters of proof as to who they were. Today, you and I call them things like letters of recommendation or, or letters of reference. Each one of them would have had letters from the king of their country confirming that they were indeed emissaries from the land, traveling there with permission from their king. And this, by the way, would have been the only, by the way, would have been the only way that they would have had an opportunity to receive the audience of Herod. Now, no one else would have been given access to Herod. You see, Herod <clears throat> was extremely paranoid at this time. He was thinking that someone was going to try to kill him. And why is that? Well, because he's not the rightful king of Judea. The fact is, he wasn't the right at all. And so their traveling papers would have, would have been their passport, if you will, so they would have been able to reach the king. Now, the question and the statement of their purpose for the visit that they make to Herod and the scribes, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, was very simple. It's very straightforward. Where is this one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw the star in the east. Implications of, of what I just said for a moment. The first announcement of the birth of the long-awaited Messiah did not come from the chief priests. It did not come from the scribes. It did not come from the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the teachers of the law to Herod. It didn't come from an angel of the Lord to these people. It didn't come from an angel of the Lord to these people either. You see, the fact is, um, the very first time that Herod hears about this, 
the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Christ stepping out of eternity and into our world, was about the Messiah, as we saw with the shepherds out in the middle of a wide open field in the middle of the night. It was the king and the religious elite of the day were not informed miraculously at all. Why? Because they could really care less about the coming of the Messiah. They were content with their own little world. They were content with their own little world working the way they wanted it to work where they had control. The first word they get that the Messiah is here is from a group of Gentile men who traveled a very long distance. And how did they know? Because they knew the word of God enough to notice. And the king was now here. Now they followed the Hebrew literature and they looked for the signs and they spotted them. And as soon as the Lord was ready, brothers and sisters, it says a whole lot about what was going on religiously in Jerusalem at that time. And by the way, it also says a whole lot about what was to come in the new kingdom that would forever be ruled by this king. I want you to consider forever be ruled by this king. I want you to consider three things that this implies. The idea that these Gentile men are the ones that deliver the message. One, that Gentiles are going to have full access to this king. Secondly, by the way, number two, is that Gentiles will be called to worship him as well. All peoples will. And three, that Christ called to worship him as well. All peoples will. And three, that Christ would be the king of the Gentiles as well. He is the king of all people. See, the Jewish elite were too preoccupied with themselves. They were too preoccupied with their power. They were too preoccupied with their control that they would completely miss the coming of the king. What else would they miss? And really, by the way, we ask the same question today of many people, don't we? I mean, those that claim to be religious, by the way, they miss the very basics of who the Christ is whether he is in control or whether they are in control, whether his will is to be done or whether their will is to be done. Does his word still apply to us or can we read? Does his word still apply to us or can we redefine and change it and make it fit our own worldview? You see, the fact is, if religious people today try to live the same lifestyle and have the same thinking that the religious elite had in the first century, there is a real good chance that you will miss Jesus the next time he comes. King Jesus... Or are we playing a role? Why is it that, the between, that, that between all the great minds of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the great minds of the teachers of the law and the scribes, that no one saw the miraculous star that was visible to the Magi for months? It's real. Months. It's real. The star was visible. Why didn't they catch their attention? They probably never looked up. Could it have been that they had already rejected the Messiah in their heart? Or, or could it be that, that the very thought, that if the Messiah came, that he would blade his word? Is it possible that they thought that, it, that, that, the, that the God would be just like them? Now, only God truly knows that. But we should be careful to learn the lessons of Scripture because they apply to us no matter what time, no matter what era we live in. God is God alone, and his word never changes. And we do not have the loan. And his word never changes. And we do not have the authority to try to do so. Well, when you talk about the Magi, you have to talk about the very thing that brought them from their homeland all the way to Israel on this journey and the search of the one born king of the Jews. And that, of course, <clears throat> is in reference to the star of Bethlehem itself. Well, the fact is, this has been debated for centuries. Now, some will say that it was a nat natural astronomical event, like a, like a comet of sorts, or maybe a supernova, or a special alignment of plant planets that only happens maybe once every so many thousands of years. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> one such event happened on May the 27th of 7 biology. Jupiter came close to, to Saturn. Saturn, by the way, represented the Jews in Babylonian astrology. And this was in the constellation Pisces which, by the way, Pisces represented Palestine. And the Persians always referred to Jupiter as a star of the king. Now, <clears throat> another recorded event of a star of the king. Now, <clears throat> another recorded event of a star that was, that was amazing was a supernova that the Korean and Chinese astrologers wrote about seeing in the sky between the months of March and April of 5 BC. Now, then there's the simple fact that maybe it was the miracle of the star. In other words, then there's the simple fact that maybe it was the miracle of the star. In other words, God created the star for this purpose in which it served. It was an unusual star in the sky that would catch the attention of those who saw it. And then 
those who knew the scriptural account of the Messiah would follow it to see the king and see who he was. And once the, once the star served me, which to me makes great sense. A miraculous situations that surround the entry of Jesus out of eternity and into our world, to me it just makes sense that the star as well would have been a miracle. I mean, after all, you have Elizabeth, who was not able to have a child, now having a child because of the hand of God. You have the silence of Zechariah. And then, of course, you have his mouth being miraculously reopened. You have Mary, who had not consummated her marriage, who was a pregnant virgin. You have the vision of Joseph. You have the angelic announcement to the shepherds. Why not the star? Why could the star not be a miracle? Remember the definition of a miracle? It is an effect or extraordinary event in the it is an effect or extraordinary event in the physical world that surpasses all known human or natural power and is ascribed to a supernatural cause. I think that's exactly what we are seeing happen here with the star. Now, could it have been one of those other things? Sure. Does it have to have been one of those other things? No, not at all. Why? The thing he wants. He is the creator and he can use the creation for whatever purpose he sees fit. Now, to solidify the fact that the Creator can do anything He wants to bring about His will, I want you to consider a moment the gifts that were brought from the Magi. There was gold. There was frankincense. There was frankincense. And there was myrrh. Now, all three of these gifts would have been a tremendous help to Joseph and Mary for their journey that they were about to take to escape the hand of Herod. But remember... They're not even aware that they're going to have to take a journey yet. The angel will tell Joseph after the Magi have left one who is seen by these men from the east as the king of the Jews. And that this morning is going to take us to our next point. Herod, the baby killer. I need to give you a little bit of history here so that we understand who Herod, the baby killer really is. Also, by the way, known as Herod, the great, but really he wasn't at all cruel and a very vicious man. He loved power and he would kill anyone who threatened it. And I also think it's good to hear the history behind who a person is. Why? Because it ties them to that point in history. And it seems, at least in the mind of some, that it makes them a real person in the eyes of the world. Now, I have said the world. Now, I have said this before and I will say it again. History does not prove the Bible. The Bible proves the rest of history. I hope that makes sense to you. But if it doesn't, please just come and see me. Alexander the Great, by the way, conquered all the Middle East and North Africa and all the way to India. It was the largest land empire of its time in just 10 years. But in 323 B.C., Alexander mysteriously dies. And so his vast empire is divided among his four generals, Lysimachus, Cassander, Ptolemy, and Seleucius. Now, the Antagonid Empire consisted of Western Turkey all the way down. Antagonid Empire consisted of Western Turkey all the way down through the northern part of Africa by the Red Sea. In Israel, in the land of Israel, a Jewish family ruled independently because that's the way they worked it out. They were Jewish kings from the Hasmonean family, by the way. And they ruled, by the way, independently. And they ruled, by the way, independently from about 140 BC all the way to 63 BC. In 63 BC, the Roman general Pompey, by the way, conquers and begins conquering all the Greek empire. And he finally comes in and conquers the area for Rome. But he allowed the king's antagonists to continue to rule under Roman authority. But in 37 to 34 BC, Herod conquers the area. Now, here's the reason why. Mark Antony, after Julius Caesar dies, becomes emperor, decides he is going to possibly move the, emperor, the Rome, the, the Rome, the, uh, the capital of Rome down to Alexandra. Octavius says there's no way. So Octavius and Mark Antony begin to vie for power and see who's going to get it. So in 37 to 34 BC, Herod conquers the Judean area and he goes and he presents it to Emperor Octavius as a gift because that Mark Antony is going to lose. And so he takes a, a risk and he conquers the area and goes to Rome and, and presents it to Octavius, who by this time has actually conquered Mark Antony. And Rome, of course, makes him king of Judea, which helps to establish the Herodian dynasty. Even though Jewish, he worked hard to, hard to please the Ro Romans, if you will. And he did this because he knew that he, they could protect him and that they would keep him in power. But now the average Israelite didn't like Herod at all. 
He overtaxed them so that he could live a lavish life. He gave land for Roman use. He spent tremendous amounts of money to build Roman. At one point, he even placed a Roman eagle over the Jewish temple door. He built the city of Caesarea Philippi, which was north of Bethsaida, where they would worship the Greek god Pan. He built the port city, the tremendous port city, by the way. It was actually one of the ancient wonders of the, of the, uh, one of the uh, ancient wonders of the world. Uh, and it was called Caesarea Maritime. This was on the coast of the Mediterranean, and there the worship of Caesar himself would take place. He taxed the people so heavily to get money to build these places so that he was not very popular among the people of Israel at all. And they knew that he was not the rightful leader of the land because he was not Hasmonean. And because of this, Herod would kill anyone that he thought was going to try to take away his power. See, Herod wasn't worried at all about those who lived west of Israel because Rome controlled the west and that area, they would protect him. But Rome did not control those east of Israel. So when the Magi from the east come looking for the one born king of the Jews, you could see why he would be greatly disturbed. Matthew chapter 2 verses 3 through 6. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. And when he called together the people's chief priests and the teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ would be born. In Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. And then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out the exact time the star had, been, had, appeared, had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go make careful search for this child. And as soon as you find him, report to me that I may go and worship as well. Now, two questions have to be asked when this passage is read. First, why was Herod so disturbed when he heard about this king of the Jews being born? Now, remember, disturbed when he heard about this king of the Jews being born. Now, remember, Rome did not control lands east of Israel. So when a royal entourage from the east say that they're looking for the king of the Jews, Herod's first thought is that these people from the east could come in and align themselves with the rebels within Israel and including the well and get him out of power. Now, by this point, Herod's life, he has become so paranoid about those who are going to try to kill him or have him removed that Herod is becoming more and more violent because he feels more and more threatened. Secondly, why is all Jerusalem disturbed by the news? Well, we have to remember that in the, remember that in the context of that which is being said, it's more likely to mean the leadership of Jerusalem, both politically, by the way, and religious. See, when a city name is often used at this time, it usually refers to the leaders. For example, why would what would Rome say? Usually meant what would the emperor or the senate say? Or if you Rome will send great punishment, that usually meant that the emperor or the senate would send troops in to squish or to squash actually the, the, the uprising. So many theologians believe this simply meant that Herod and his court, political and religious, were greatly disturbed because if there truly was a king of the Jews born, it would mean an end to their power. About the average person in Jerusalem as well, the average Israelite. They would, have, they would have been disturbed because this would have caused them to begin to wonder what an already paranoid Herod was going to do when he assumed that everybody was against him. You see, this could have been devastating. The fact is, Herod already had many, Herod already had many people killed as he, the people that he took as a threat, real or otherwise, whether that was a real threat or not, to his throne. So he, he, it is said, by the way, that the Jewish people suffered more under Herod than their forefathers did in Babylonian captivity or under Persian rule with Xerxes. For 30 years that someone wasn't being sentenced to death. Herod spared no one at all, not even his own family. Close friends, not priests, not even regular people. Here are just some, a very few amount of the names that have the list of his victims. Two husbands of his sister Salome, two husbands of his sister Salome were killed. His wife, Miriam, by the way, and the two sons he had by her, Aristobulus and Alexander, and his mother-in-law, Alexandra, were killed. He had placed the Roman eagle of authority over the gate of the temple. Two Jewish scholars took it down because it was blasphemy. He had them in the public square. Herod had, had Hyrcanus, the last Hasmonean in the line, to be killed as well. He had a noble family completely wiped out. 
From patriarch to the youngest child, he had Pharisees and Sadducees killed because they did not support him publicly. And just five days before his own death, he had his son, five days before his own death, he had his son Antipater assassinated. Why? Just because he could. And this is only a fraction of the murderers that he committed because of his paranoia that someone would attempt to take away his throne and his power. So let me continue for a moment revealing the his power. So let me continue for a moment revealing the mindset of this man. Herod knew about the coming of the Messiah. He had heard about the teachings and yet he thought that somehow he was going to be able to stop God himself from stepping out of eternity and into our world. Now, that is the epitome of stopping the hand of God from doing his will or to think that you could just not believe and therefore God wouldn't be real. And yet, by the way, that's the mentality of many people in the world today, isn't it? I don't believe there's a God, therefore he isn't real. Or I don't want to believe that Jesus is the one who sets our standards, therefore I set my own. Believe that Jesus is the one who sets our standards, therefore I set my own. See, both of these concepts are the same arrogance and the same conceit that Herod had. And many of the religious leaders of the day folded to Herod. They publicly supported him. They would never speak out against his sinful lifestyle. And this goes to show the mind asks the Magi secretly of the exact time they saw the star when it appeared. He's already trying to calculate how old this king might be. He's already working towards a strategy in his mind to eliminate this threat to his throne and to his power. And then he sends them to Bethlehem. And he tells him, though, go and make a careful search for this child. And as soon as you find him, which is an absolute lie, he wanted them to come back and tell him where the Messiah was so that he could go and murder the king of the Jews. But his plan doesn't work for him. And that'll lead us now to our last point this morning, a new direction. Matthew chapter nine, verses, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter two, verses nine, Matthew chapter nine, verses, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter two, verses nine through 12. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star that they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, they saw the child and his mother Mary, and they bowed down and they worshipped him of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream to not go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. The distance from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, it's only about five to six miles isn't very far at all. And considering the distance the Magi had traveled, this literally would have been nothing to them. If the Magi had traveled, this literally would have been nothing to them. It would have been a hop, skip, and a jump. And when they find the home of Joseph and Mary, they go in and they see Jesus. Remember, he would have been somewhere between 12 and 18 months old. And you have to wonder, what did they think when they saw him? I mean, after this long trip, So they obviously believed that he was the special king that they had read about. Now, the Greek word proskunio is the English word worship, which means to express an attitude and one's allegiance to and regard for a deity to bow down. So we know that their worship for Christ was real. This was not made up and it wasn't just a real. This was not made up and it wasn't just a kind gesture. This was real worship. But wouldn't it have been wonderful to know what they thought? I think so. They present Joseph and Mary with the gifts of gold and of frankincense and of myrrh. And as a couple with with very little means, but even more so for what was to come. Remember, Joseph and Mary are not yet aware of the fact that they're going to have to flee Israel and go to Egypt in order to escape the plot of Herod to kill the Messiah. These, These gifts would have helped provide financial means to make that journey. And I want you to think about that for a moment as well. Gaia, these these gifts would have helped provide financial means to make that journey. And I want you to think about that for a moment as well. God was already preparing the provisions for Joseph and Mary's journeys years before they even knew that they were going to need it. His timing is always perfect. Even had been warned by the Lord in a dream not to go back to Herod and to tell him where Jesus was. And they obey the Lord and they return home by a different route, and they never inform Herod. Now, I want you to think about it this way. Meeting the Lord has a way of changing your direction, doesn't it? I'm changing your direction, doesn't it? I I once thought that it was okay to do something, and the more I study and seek my Lord and my Savior, I realize that I need to walk a different route in my life. 
I, I don't need to continue to walk the route that I know there's tremendous hazards, that there's tremendous temptations, or that there are people that might try to draw me away in another way. Now, there's one final question, by the way, that we need to ask and that we need to answer. Was Herod capable of killing innocent babies? Well, the answer to that is absolutely yes. You see, Herod orders the murder of boys two years and vicinity. Thousands of baby boys were killed because of a power-hungry paranoia of a man who wanted to see himself as a god of sorts, if you will. And he would do, do this by anything. He would do it no matter what if he was going to be able to hold on to his power. So many people all the time, if Herod would kill his own sons, well, then the sons of someone else are not going to matter to him. You see, in history, the killing of the baby boys in Bethlehem and in the vicinities is referred to as the murder of the innocents. Herod the Great really wasn't great at all. Herod was a baby killer. He was paranoid. He was power hungry. And of course, needless to say, he didn't even revere life at all. He loved power. But the Magi? They journeyed to find the king. They journeyed to find the Messiah, and they found him, and they won. And then they walked a different route. But what about you, though? Are you on a journey to find the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Are you seeking the Messiah for your life? Uh, if you are truly seeking him, you will find him. But if you found him, are you walking a new route in your life? Because if you aren't, maybe today's the day that you can begin to start. Because you see, walking the way you always have will lead you into the same trouble you always fell into. Friends, today, I invite you to accept the grace of God by faith in what Jesus Christ did for you at Calvary's cross. And in Christian baptism, bury your old self and arise as a new person in Christ that you might begin walking a new route and you will find the king of all kings. Mm -hmm.